In this video, I'm going to be looking at how you can score as close to full marks as possible in your AQA biology exam. It's something I get asked an awful lot, so I just want to give you my top tips for doing really well. And now the obvious thing is to prepare properly, and that means hopefully getting a good night's sleep, making sure you've eaten breakfast if it's a morning exam, lunch if it's an afternoon exam. You don't want to be distracted by hunger pangs, that would be ridiculous. So make sure you've eaten and that you are well hydrated. Try not to eat a meal too heavy in carbs because it might make you a little bit sleepy. And obviously good sleep hygiene is important so make sure you go to bed reasonably early. Don't look at your phone before you're dropping off. And maybe do a little bit of exercise in order to make yourself physically tired so that hopefully you'll be mentally tired in order to get a good night's sleep. But what about my top tips about how you actually do well in the paper? So the obvious thing is to make sure you answer every single question. I know a lot of people are tempted to leave questions blank if they don't know what the answer is. That is ridiculous. Remember, you are anonymous to whoever is marking your paper. So even if you consider it to be a stupid thing that you're saying, they don't care. They don't know that it was Joe that did it or Hannah. So make sure that you actually answer every question. Remember, you'll definitely score zero marks if you leave it completely blank. Other things to watch out for is if it asks you to tick two boxes, make sure you tick two boxes, not three. If it asks you to circle one answer, make sure you're only circling one. Just really key stuff. And don't be the person that doesn't answer the question on the last page. I've had so many people be like, oh, I didn't see the last question. Make sure you've actually worked out where the last question is and make sure you've answered it. Anyway, now I want to talk you through making last minute notes. Now, these are notes that you have just a few things written on that you refer to just before you go into the exam. It might be stuff that you particularly struggle with or can't remember, but just make sure you've made a few notes maybe on an A4 piece of paper and remember that the things you struggle with will be different to what other people struggle with so don't be too worried if your notes have different things on them so what would I personally write on my last minute notes now I always struggled a little bit with transport so that means diffusion active transport osmosis so I might make myself a little mini spider diagram so I'd call it movement of substances. So with that we have diffusion, which remember is from high to low concentration, it's passive, it requires no ATP. Active transport is the opposite of that, it's from low concentration to high concentration and it does require energy because it is an active process. Lastly, osmosis, which is a variant of diffusion, crucially it involves the movement of water from an area of high concentration to low so again it's diffusion no energy needed and it occurs through a partially permeable membrane don't forget the terms isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic this relates to the concentration of water found within a cell and the surrounding solution so if the concentrations are the same then it is isotonic now if the solution contains less water than in the cell then it's a hypotonic solution if it contains more water than the cell then it's hypotonic don't forget that a red blood cell, so an animal cell placed in pure water, will burst. Why is that? Well, that's because water floods in. There's no cell wall, so it effectively fills up and then explodes, whereas a plant cell will become turgid rather than explode, and that's due to the presence of the cell wall. I've never really enjoyed learning all the food tests. Remember that I like to give really concise wording that scores maximum marks without having to learn loads of extra stuff that is just time consuming and unnecessary and quite frankly annoying. So remember the test for starch. What are we adding? Iodine. What do we see happen? It goes from brown to blue black in the presence of starch. What about testing for glucose? Well, this time you need Benedict's reagent You need to heat it and you'll see it go from blue to brick red in the presence of glucose. How about lipids now? So fats. Well, in this case, you shake it with water and ethanol and a positive result for lipids or fats will be a milky white emulsion. And then lastly, the test for protein. You want to use bioarray reagent I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, I always struggle. And you'll see a purple colour form if you have a positive result. Now don't forget your key long answer questions. You want to make sure that you've really 
learn these answers so that you can score full marks. So how do we take a breath in? Learn this as a list of steps. So our intercostal muscles contract. Our diaphragm contracts, which means it flattens. The rib cage moves up and out. The volume inside the thorax increases, which means that the pressure decreases so that air is effectively sucked into the lungs. What about breathing out? Well, just remember for me that it is the opposite. So let's make it the opposite. Intercostal muscles relax. Diaphragm relaxes, it becomes domed shaped. The rib cage moves down and in, the volume decreases, therefore the pressure increases and air is pushed out. How about a little reminder on the heart? So draw this as your box, really straightforward. Remember that the left side is actually on the right side. There's the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right atria, the right ventricle. Remember that arteries leave the heart and that veins bring blood back to the heart. Remember for me that the left side is oxygenated, the right side is deoxygenated. So in terms of the labels, well, what will be bringing oxygenated blood back to the heart? Well, that will be the pulmonary vein. Oxygenated blood leaves the heart via an artery, which is the aorta. Deoxygenated blood returns to the heart in the vena cava. Deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs for oxygenation via the pulmonary artery. Remember that pulmonary means relating to the lungs. You could draw yourself a mini diagram showing the difference between arteries, veins and capillaries. Really straightforward. The narrow lumen and thick muscle and elastic fibre walls belong to arteries. Remember for me that blood pressure is high. The veins now, you're going to have a wide lumen. You're going to have a thin muscle and elastic fibre wall. And you'll have little valves that prevent the backflow of blood. Lastly, the capillaries, they have a narrow lumen and they are only one cell thick, which allows rapid diffusion of gases. Don't forget immunity, so white blood cells. We've got two types, the phagocytes. Now they have a lobed nucleus. They carry out phagocytosis, which means that they ingest or engulf pathogens. Remember that pathogens are microorganisms which cause disease. If we compare them to the lymphocyte, these are different. Remember that a pathogen has various proteins on its surface, which we call antigens. And the way in which lymphocytes work is they produce antibodies which come and attach to these antigens, making it more likely for the phagocytes to recognize them. So if I wanted to write a full mark answer how lymphocytes work, I would start by saying that lymphocytes recognize antigens present on pathogens. They produce antibodies which attack them and help the phagocytes engulf them more easily. And that's an answer which is crammed full of scientific words and scientific content. How does a vaccine work? Well, it's very similar. This time you are injecting a weakened form of the pathogen. You can say again that the lymphocytes recognize the antigen. They produce antibodies. Crucially, some of these lymphocytes turn into memory cells and upon re-entry of the pathogen, the really important thing to say here is that antibodies are produced A, much faster, B, much sooner, and C, a much greater number. So I hope you can see we're really building up our answers here. If you like these sorts of answers that I'm giving, remember that my revision guide is crammed full of these perfect answers and you can find that at our online shop which is www.sciencewithhazel.com Another thing to be good on, remember, it's super essential that you're good with Corm's questions which are basically experimental design. I don't like using Corm's if you've been 
following me for a while, you'll know I don't like using this structure. It is essential though that you score full marks on the experimental design question because there are no surprises here. They follow the same layout year on year, so there's really no excuses for dropping easy marks here. So remember, for me, when I'm planning an experiment, I like to do my independent variable, so what I'm changing, and I'll actually show you an example of this in situ in an exam question later. The dependent variable, which is what I'm measuring, and then the control variable, and these are multiple variables, so everything that you'll be keeping the same. And often, because it's bio, you'll need to state a time period, make sure it's sensible, and then the final thing you should do is repeat and calculate an average. So that is your basic framework.